I have no conflict with, uh, with Christian beliefs, my Christian beliefs, and, and with the scientific methods uh, that I also believe in as well. So, you know, I don't see anything that's contradictory to this. Uh, Luther, you're more of, uh, you, you, uh, Am I on? Okay. You're more of an expert at this than I am, so I was just going to uh, uh, ask you to elaborate a little bit of uh, the possibility of getting some corroborative evidence of uh, uh, something like the Big Bang uh, through the uh, view of the Hubble back into uh, uh, time. Is that something that uh, might provide corroborative evidence for that? Uh, yes. The the, the scientific record uh, is, is accumulating uh, substantially about our, our measurements and, and uh, essentially what is going on in the universe and uh, essentially what, uh, what we know about uh, the mechanism of this. We're dealing with astronomical sizes and huge and huge and huge places. And if it started with uh, a little place the size of an atom, we do know that it has done, I can tell you one thing that we can all say that is true. Time has always gone forward and time goes forward with entropy into diversity and diversity generates through time, it creates everything that's possible. And what we have today possible is what we have and what we are observing. Dr. Hoven, you will now have three minutes to uh, rebuttal that statement, and then I will ask you a completely independent question. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created based on the Big Bang Theory. Textbooks say 18 or 20 billion years ago, there was a, all the matter in the universe, which would be a lot of stuff, and by the way, the word universe means a single spoken sentence. Universe, single spoken sentence. God said. When he said there nothing can exist outside the universe, this is about like two computers talking to each other. Does man exist? Nothing exists outside the computer. We're it. Uh, duh. Okay. Um, all the matter in the universe was in concentrated in one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. I think that's what we just heard a moment ago, okay? This textbook says, after many billions of years, all the matter and energy will once again be packed into a small area. This area will be no larger than the period at the end of this sentence. Then another big bang will occur. It happens every 80 to 100 billion years. Save the planet, we're gonna get squished, folks, okay? This guy said, uh, nothing really means nothing. That's, that's brilliant, okay. Not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. However, physicists theorize that from the state of nothingness, the universe began in a gigantic explosion. I believe that's what I just heard in the last few minutes, okay? This whole Big Bang idea started with a guy named George, or Isaac, uh, I mean, uh, Edward George Latimer, who said the thing that exploded was a few light years in diameter. Well, at the least, that's about 12 trillion miles, okay? Then by 1965, they said, well, it was only 275 million miles. 1972, I think it was Scientific American said, no, the thing that exploded, the Big Bang, came from something only 71 million miles in diameter. Later, they said, oh, no, it's only 54,000 miles. 1983, they said, the thing that exploded was a trillionth the diameter of a proton. Now, that's tiny, okay? And now they're saying nothing exploded. Here's Discover Magazine two years ago. Where did everything come from? The universe burst into something from absolutely nothing. Zero. Nada. As it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. How is that possible? Ask Alan Guth. His theory will explain everything. Well, what does Alan Guth say? In Scientific American, Alan Guth says, the observable universe could have evolved from an infinitesimal region. That's a dot. He said it's then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. Folks, why would a sentence like this be found in Scientific American? There's nothing scientific about that state. It exhibits incredible faith. But the textbooks teach this, this dot was spinning. It spun faster and faster. Finally, it exploded. The Big Bang. There are so many problems with the Big Bang. Simple physical science problems. What exploded? Where did the matter come from? Where did the energy come from? Where did the organization come from? Where did the information come from? Um, he, the, the story he gave was so good, I got to replay the tape and hear this, you know. 4.6 billion years ago, the planet developed a rocky crust. The chemicals got together, you know, blah, blah, blah. Here we are. Exactly what I said earlier. That's what the, that's what the theory teaches. Now, if he wants to believe that, that's fine. I don't care what you believe. But don't call that science. 
And don't make me pay to teach that to the rest of these kids in this university. These kids came here to learn some science, not a fairy tale like that. Thank you. Dr. Hovind, the next question will be posed to you. You'll have seven minutes, and then the evolutionists will have three minutes. Uh, the question's more of an open-end one. Uh, please prove, disprove, or generally talk about carbon dating and how it relates to evolution. <clears throat> Get my projector on here. See, I have about... 7,000 slides in PowerPoint, so it helps if you ask the questions in the same order that I have the answers. Uh, <laughs> carbon dating? Okay. Carbon dating, uh, actually fossils are dated by their position in the geologic column. They are not dated by carbon dating or potassium, argon, rubidium, strontium, lead 208, lead 206. None of those matter. A fossil is dated by the position in the geologic column. They're called index fossils. This guy admits it. Radiometric dating would not have been feasible if the geologic column had not been erected first. The geologic column was invented in 1830s. <clears throat> that was taught for 120 years and became accepted as science. And the geologic column doesn't exist any place on the planet. Okay, there is no geologic column. There are layers of rocks. And they're assuming that it's different ages. That's the problem right there. Uh, this guy says, fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method of, of dating and correlating the rocks in which they occur. We go through all kinds of examples on this, but on video seven. The Earth's atmosphere is about 100 miles thick. It is mostly nitrogen, 78%. 21% oxygen, a little bit of CO2 for plants to breathe, and very little radioactive carbon-14. 0.00007655%. This radioactive carbon-14 mixes with oxygen and it becomes carbon dioxide, most of it does, and the plants are breathing carbon dioxide. Now carbon-14 is formed when radiation strikes the atmosphere. The nitrogen, which is the majority of gas are up, up there and here, nitrogen, gets bombarded by cosmic rays and it bombards the upper atmosphere, producing fast-moving neutrinos. These neutrinos collide with atmospheric nitrogen, producing carbon-14. That's how it's made. If you look at a, a periodic table, carbon and nitrogen are right next to each other. Nitrogen is normally an atomic weight of 14 and carbon is an atomic weight of 12. But if the nitrogen gets blasted with these neutrinos, it turns into carbon-14, which is a rare, very rare, and radioactive element. It is radioactive just like uranium or any other radioactive element, and you can hear it as it decays or breaks apart and throws off all the little particles into, the, into space around it. Now, carbon-14 is being produced by the sun, or by the neutrinos, by the high-speed radiation, Long, doesn't matter. It breaks back down to nitrogen. About half of it breaks down every 5,730 years. Okay, this is the estimated to be the half-life. Obviously, nobody watched it for 5,700 years. But during photosynthesis, plants are breathing in CO2. And so the animals eat the plants and make it part of their body. So you and I probably have carbon-14 in us because at some time in your life, you have either eaten plants or you've eaten animals that have eaten plants. That's about all there is, okay? So these plants are absorbing things uh, out of the atmosphere. They're absorbing the carbon-14. It becomes part of their tissue. It is assumed the ratio of C14 to normal C12 in the atmosphere would be the same ratio found in living plants and animals. If the atmosphere is 0.00007655%, it is assumed plants and animals have the same percentage. That has never been demonstrated, but that's a, that's a reasonable assumption. Okay. When the plant or animal dies, it stops taking in new C14, so in theory you can tell how long it's been dead by measuring how much C14 is left. This entire process was invented by Willard Libby, Nobel Prize winner uh, for inventing carbon dating. Uh, University of Chicago, 1947 to 53, he worked on this, moved to Stanford University. Carbon-14 continues to decay after the animal dies. If half of it's gone, you would assume it's been dead 5,700 years. It can't get any more, obviously, so it's going to go out of balance. Carbon dating is actually a comparison of the carbon-14 in the object with 